Hi, welcome to the Awkward Angler Podcast, an authentic series talking about fishing, social justice, and storytelling with folks within the outdoor industry. I'm your host, Erica Nelson. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a self-taught angler that is passionate about sharing my learning journey. I am also a Brown Folks Fishing Ambassador and organizational leadership developer with incredible amounts of optimism. Understanding that we all have something to learn from each other, this podcast is for the aspiring, the beginner, the mediocre, and the expert angler willing to learn new skills and how to be a better ally. Working through hard conversations can definitely get a little awkward. We fumble through them and worry about getting it right. It's time to step out of your comfort zone and start getting awkward. This show is for mature audiences. Be sure to follow for updates on awkwardangler.com and on Instagram at awkwardangler. Hi, welcome to the Awkward Angler Podcast, an authentic series talking about fishing, social justice, and storytelling with folks within the outdoor industry. I'm your host, Erica Nelson. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a self-taught fly angler that is passionate about sharing my learning journey. Understanding that we all have something to learn from each other, this podcast is for the aspiring, the beginner, the mediocre, and the expert angler willing to learn new skills and how to be a better ally. This show is for mature audiences. Be sure to follow for updates on awkwardangler.com and on Instagram at awkwardangler. In fishing culture, There's a strong belief that social media and geotagging is killing fishing. There are often times guides or other anglers will get bullied for geotagging, and part of fishing culture is to never ask and never tell your fishing spots. As it's growing in popularity, I'm noticing an increase of gatekeeping and online bullying as well. I find that there's complexity in geotagging when it comes to fishing, especially with overcrowding and vulnerable areas in fish. I'm looking to break the barrier as it's oftentimes taboo to even talk about, and I observe strong opinions and fixing blame take over. I found it necessary to have multiple perspectives, and I'm so thankful for the following folks that carved out time to have this discussion. I'm so excited to have my good friend Jalen Goff, founder of Native Women's Wilderness, and Vasu Sojitra, professional athlete, diversity strategist, and your friendly neighborhood disruptor. I'm also excited to welcome back Anna Lay, fish biologist, and Marco Kamamura, owner and founder of She Can Next Fly. There's an article written called Five Reasons Why You Should Keep Geotagging by Danielle Williams, who's the founder of Melanin Base Camp, and we reference this article throughout our discussion. All links and resources are on awkwardangler.com. Hi, Erica. Um, welcome, everyone. Glad to be back, and thank you for allowing me back on this platform. Um, I was on episode one, so I'm Anna Lay. I am a biologist and an environmental educator currently in Southern California and working from home. Thanks. Awesome. And Jaylen. Hi, everyone. Hi, Erica. My name is Jaylen Goff, and I am the founder of Native Women's Wilderness. And I am a Dene woman who is actually currently residing on the Arapaho U Cheyenne Shoshone lands here in Boulder, Colorado. I am really excited to be here. Um, I think this is kind of a really awesome conversation or topic for Native and Indigenous people. So I think this could be a really interesting conversation. Thank you. All right, Marco. Hi, um, I'm Marco Kamimura, uh, he, him, his, and uh, I'm currently in Grinnell, Iowa on the uh, Sauk and Meskwaki lands. Um, and I am owner, founder of uh, Chica Next Fly uh, Guide Service, and I'm also a commercial professional fly tire here in uh, Iowa. Sweet. Thank you. And Vasu. Hey, my name is Vasu Sojitra. Uh, pronouns are he, him, his. And I'm on the lands of the Crow, Northern Cheyenne, Salish Kootenai, Shoshone, Bannock, Blackfeet, and many others that call Bozeman, Montana home. Um, I'm a professional athlete, uh, title sponsors the North Face, as well as a DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion strategist, and the co-founder for Inclusive Outdoors Project. Uh, And I tend to be labeled as the friendly neighborhood disruptor. (laughs) So so that's where I'm at. (laughs) I love it. Thanks again. 
Uh, thanks you all for, again, for your time and the work that you do in this space. And I'm just so excited to spend the rest of the hour with you. So just kind of starting off, I'd love to hear each person share a general overview, maybe in your profession or just in your outdoor personal adventures. Um, what's your understanding of geotagging, personal experience? Have you done it? Have you never done it? Have you heard of it? So um, we'll go ahead and do this again with the same um, rotation. And then if you're super passionate about chiming in, feel free to, to do that but we'll go ahead and start with Anna. Awesome. Thank you, Erica. Um, my general understanding of geotagging came primarily from social media and kind of like the influencer world and how people would tag where they are regarding in their photos. Um, so for me, geotagging is a little bit more like gray in the fact that it's not really like good or bad in a way, but um, from multiple perspectives. If I'm wanting to find a place to go to or hike to a different place, then I usually go to Instagram and follow like where my friends are heading. Um, but in like a conservation standpoint, I can kind of see like how geotagging can be very disruptive, especially to um, communities that are very vulnerable. And also if you are trespassing or on land that you shouldn't be on. Um, so kind of seeing it from both perspectives. And I would love to hear what everyone else has to say because everyone has different opinions and perspectives. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks for bringing that up because I really hope that we feel comfortable sharing our perspectives because we all have different backgrounds and experience. And um, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Uh, what about Jalen? So I'm also kind of in the same boat with Anna. I came across geotagging with um, Instagram. Um, and I, I don't know, I've always, from the very beginning, I've always been a little skeptical of geotagging, um, just because, um, not to what Danielle pointed out in the article about trying to keep, be the gatekeepers, right, but as Native people, we are the protectors of the land, right, we've always protected the land, and I think for me personally, um, I've seen geotagging be really detrimental to these sacred spots. Um, mm -hmm. And so I personally am a little wary of geotagging, um, just to just keeping in mind the sacredness of the land um, and what the land can offer and bring you when you're when you're present, right? And sometimes it's hard to be present when you are in the thrones of a whole lot of people around you doing selfies and whatnot. But um, yeah, I think for me personally, geotagging is a little, is a little rough, mm -hmm. um, mainly of keeping our land sacred. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. What about Marco? So again, you know, my concept or understanding is from in, uh, Instagram, social media. Um, I, uh, I also kind of group geotagging into particularly, bring it into the fly fishing conversation, uh, naming of waters mm -hmm. um, as well. Um, because, you know, it's pretty easy to look something up, you know, and, and find, you know, with the name uh, and find the pin itself or whatever, at least general area, um, similar to what a, an actual geotag would physically do. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, you know, on occasion, I don't really do it on, on Instagram, but um, I will, you know, openly share information with uh, small closed groups, um, you know, in the state usually that I'm fishing. Um, I don't share broadly like on large platforms. Um, kind of going back to what I maybe even mentioned, I did on the uh, previous podcast about like I try to keep information local mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know and how I um, even uh, seek clientele and stuff like that um, and so uh, actually the one time I did physically geotag in the location uh, I got shredded for it um, mm -hmm. and it's the most famous uh, creek in our state because that's where all of our brown trout come from Literally, it's on every page of the Iowa DNR website. Of course, same thing. I think geotagging has been pro primarily through social media and primarily Instagram because of location, uh, that uh, addition of location that we can do on all of our posts. Um, and that's kind of where I've seen it mostly. 
Um, and my my concept of geotagging is kind of based around it being kind of this cop out band-aid uh, scapegoat to like point fingers at instead of mm -hmm. trying to really resolve um, the limited resources a lot of you know native communities that have you know have resources to protect the land or a lot of land management communities or organizations have to to either educate the population that might be coming there or um, other various resources to be able to try to, again, protect and steward the land that's around. Um, I don't personally think, you know, tagging a certain location, um, it, does it does bring influx, but also with that influx, I think we have to understand that we also have to teach a lot of the populations that are utilizing the lands to be able to also be stewards of those areas when they do visit. Um, but I don't think that's been really incorporated into any kind of education system within the US. So I'm I'm kind of looking at it as like this band-aid thing that people are pointing fingers at. I totally would resonate with all of those perspectives as well. And I think one of the things that I keep running into is that blaming. It's that fixing blame on, you know, newbies or just visitors. And there's really not a whole lot of resources out there for um, more education for people, especially when um, new anglers are entering the sport and it's really difficult to figure out like where to go, you know, and, and then there's like this other educational component of how vulnerable is this area, right? So, mm -hmm. so how, what, um, this is a question for anybody, um, how do you balance these issues, right, of protecting vulnerable areas, sacred places, but also not limiting access for new folks trying to get into fishing or hiking or recreation? Um, how do you balance that? Um, I think for me, I kind of balance it and I think to myself, is this a place where I feel comfortable that a lot of people can come and traverse on and explore? Um, I have been to different um, dwellings, ancient dwellings within, you know, Bears Ears or the, um, various canyons um, along the Grand Canyon and whatnot um, in Moab. And there, there's times where I've taken pictures because I'm also an avid photographer where I have to think of the land itself. Like, you know, if I'm on a trail in Rocky Mountain National Park, no problem, right? But if I'm on this trail in the middle of Moab, in the middle of nowhere, and I've done an extensive amount of research to get to this particular dwelling, um, I typically wouldn't share that, um, mainly just to keep the place sacred um, and beautiful and clean. Where I'm at is having more personal conversations with people. I mean, it's definitely time consuming and energy intensive to be able to like know, let them know like this is the, this is a sacred place. It's a very you know fragile place. Maybe it's like on top of a mountain where, um, you know low traffic is necessary so uh, the plants and vegetation can still th thrive um, that's kind of where i'm at but i'm also in the perspective that i think we still have to teach people to be stewards so then they can find their own spaces instead of like finding those secret spots like pretty much finding their own secret spots you know like which then they can try to like utilize like, oh, this is how I, you know, research this area. And this is how, what, you know, uh, maps I used and the skills that come with um, finding these more like remote locations that many people might not know of instead of just like throwing it out there. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, that's where my head's, head's at. I wanna build off of what uh, Basu just said um, about uh, kind of like educating different people so that they can find their own space. Um, I, be I believe as an angler and I feel like, you know, as an, I, an, in, an intimately relational angler, <laughs> um, like with the land and the waters, like 
there are certain areas that call to me, like that I feel that I have a true deep connection with. And those are waters that I intend, I make an intention to grow in deep relationships so that when the time comes, I can speak for them um, in the right way, um, in a just way. Um, and I feel that a lot of that a lot of people that spend any amount of time in natural spaces or on the land like feel that as well in different ways. Um, and I talk about like to me, like with my clients in particular and with just people in general, like choose, I, I think I mentioned it even in the last podcast, like healing doesn't come until you form that relationship. And the relationship to me is through knowledge, but you know, like intention and love and like, um, I guess learning, right? It's the educational components, the more we learn about the land um, and with the land, the deeper our connection grows. Um, and the more places that you're able to kind of put under that umbrella of learning and connecting with the, um, I suppose, the more refined your connection will be to certain areas. Um, and that's how we become protectors um, in my in my experience. Uh, so anyway, that kind of struck that with me. And I think I like to echo off with everyone what you all just said. Um, I think as an educator, when I'm bringing up my students to these forests or to these rivers and kind of exposing them to the very first time that they're seeing a salmon or being in a forest or being out there on a hiking trail and kind of showing them how to be stewards of the land and bring back that reciprocity that we have long forgotten to, you know, take care of the land so the land can take care back to you. Um, and for these students or some of these folks, they are, you know, 12 years old or in their teens and never have been out there. So me being able to share that with them is in such an awesome opportunity. Um, but then also, I think I talked to Marco about this the other day is that social media wasn't a thing back then. So like when you're finding these places, you're putting in the work yourself and other people from around the world in different states aren't flocking to this one popular area um, due to Instagram or due to social media. So even though like education is out there through interpretation and historians and naturalists, it's like there's only so much you can do. Um, and like the whole geotagging or gatekeeping is kind of an unfortunate event where it's like you're punishing the few that's like ruining these places because they're flocking and they're not stewards of the land. Um, you're seeing that now with national parks um, or state parks, such as like the Devil's Tower in Wyoming. When I went to visit there, there are prayer flags around and they're saying like, please don't trespass. Like this is sacred land. Um, indigenous and native people still come here for prayers, but unfortunately people still bypass that and don't pay attention to those educational resources. So in a way it's, and it's in a gray area where it's like, there are educational resources out there. We're doing the best that we can, but at the same time, those few individuals who are still, you know, trespassing or disrespecting the land and not bring that reciprocity or acting as stewards, um, it's ruining just the opportunity for everyone to be out there and enjoy the land or the waters or the air. One thing that I want to kind of circle back on that was just said in that round was um, kind of creating, find your own, find your own spot. <laughs> So when I hear that, I'm kind of like, ah, <laughs> what do you mean? Like, I'm just trying to figure out how to fish. I don't know where to go. I just moved to this area. I'm about to move to another area. So like, how do you actually find like information other than, you know, because like what I've come to find in fishing particularly is there's not a lot of great information out there. So when I Google an area, it's outdated or access is no longer available because of erosion or, um, you know, there's just not awesome information from how do you <laughs> encourage a new person that wants, is so eager to get out there, but then you're telling me or them to like find your own space. So how do you, yeah, what's your, go ahead, Mark, are you? <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I was actually just exploring this idea in the past couple of weeks um, in that, like, so I'll, I guess I'll just be blatant, you know, blunt about it. Like I, to me, when I visit a new place now and I had to grow into this, I was not this way always. Um, but um, I just like, I, I'm, I haven't fished Minnesota very much while I've been here and 
I literally fish within five miles of the border of Minnesota and Iowa on the Iowan side. Um, but I've done that on purpose. Um, and that's because I don't know the systems that function, the laws that function at, to in place to protect uh, or not uh, those waters um, and those places. And so um, I chose to uh, reach out to a guide and I recognize my privilege in being able to do that, you know, successfully and, and um, um, nicely, I guess, um, with a, a good res positive response. Um, and I just asked, I was like, you know, I, I'm, I'm new and, um, I want to, uh, I, and you know, the water is better than I do, especially right now under very, we are under a pretty dra a drastic drought for the Midwest, <laughs> as in we haven't received, we've received one rain since, since July, the end of July. Um, and so the waters have been extremely low for a very long time. Um, so putting a lot of fish under stress, um, which is why I haven't fished since October. This past weekend was the first time I went out scouting some uh, waters that I knew again to see what was going going on. And so I, I kind of reached out to them as well. And I, you know, just asked, I was like, you know, what are you seeing? Um, do you think it's, it's right for me or do you think it's healthy uh, for me to be out there? Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking for some, some other areas to potentially fish because our waters are, are under great stress, um, are yours as well. And where would you recommend, um, you know, if I do head up? There? Um, and so I think that's why representation is such a big deal um, as far as knowing who to go to and who to feel comfortable asking questions to. Um, that's huge. Um, I know when I first started fishing, um, I went to my local fly shop and thankfully um, my local fly shop wasn't stuck with, you know, these old cranky white men who call you, hey, little girl or a little lady. Um, and they were, I don't know, they were just so really helpful. And, um, and then I started looking for opportunities to fish with other women. Um, so I started looking for opportunities on Facebook, um, just, you know, started using hashtags of fly fishing, fly fishing for women. Uh, and then the, the angling shop that I actually um, still go to has, or well then had an um, what, anglers women's club. And so every Thursday we would go out fishing. Um, we would share different spots. We would drink beer. You know, we would like teach each other the different fly um, tying techniques. Um, and then you know, and you know, Erica and I have talked this talked about this a lot. And we've gone to multiple fly shops together about just having the courage or just like trying to like rein in the patience to go into a fly shop one as a woman and then two as a woman of color um, brings in a whole different ball game. Mm -hmm. And so, but I've really have utilized the fly shops. However, there are times right before I go fishing that I just don't have the head space or the mind space to go into a fly shop. And so what I have found myself doing is just finding, you know, going to the river, just walking along it, finding a spot, um, I'll sit and watch on um, where the anglers are going, where they're staying, where they're kind of passing through. Um, and that's how usually I find various places or I'll go hang out with Erica <laughs> <laughs> and we just drive around and we, you know, pull over and laugh and have a drink and then get back in the car and find another bend and, <laughs> you know, like just, just, just doing stuff like that. But, um, for me personally, I have the ability to do that, right? Like I have a car, I have these resources, mm -hmm. I have my own fishing gear so I can go out and do these items. But if, if you know, my advice to new anglers um, would be to utilize your fly shop and to see if there are any local um, women or, you know, people of color or, you know, anglers around you. A mutual friend of a lot of ours, uh, Pinar told me that, um, the revolution is going to be relational. Mm -hmm. And I please, I totally 100% believe in that, that, 
you know, it's not when I say like, find your own secret spots, it's going to be find your own secret spots with the support and help of community and relationships, just like your fly shops. And just like the small connections that you might make on the river or with, you know, the women of color fishing groups or whoever it may be, um, is to just like, try to share resources again, to be able to steward and protect and still recreate um, on the rivers. I personally am a skier. So I'm like, you know, pun intended, a fish out of water in this conversation around <laughs> fishing. But like, <laughs> um, that's kind of where I'm at is like that discretionary measure is so like deeply rooted that it that's what's causing, I think, a lot of folks to be anxious or not even wanting to join the sport or um, specifically, you know, for me, I'm talking about backcountry skiing, but it's a very similar mindset. Um, and I think that's that gatekeeping mentality that I'm trying to break down is like, no, it's not about like sharing your secret spot. It's about sharing the knowledge to be able to find um, these secret spots together or solo or whatever. I'm hoping like people don't go backcountry skiing alone. It's very dangerous, but um, you know, it's just like, that's kind of where I'm at is like building relationships slowly. It's going to take some time. You're not going to be able to just like go find a really cool spot tomorrow. Um, unless you have that knowledge. Yeah, that's awesome. And I love that saying from Panar. That's amazing. Cause it's mm -hmm. true. It's so true, especially working in, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, justice work. It really starts at the relational level, not, you know, with yourself and then others. So, mm -hmm. um, I love it. So I'm curious, actually, Vasu, you kind of brought up a, a point that I wanted to bring up in this conversation was the geotag um, tag responsibly. And I just wanted your perspective and your thoughts on that or from you and anybody else that I've seen. I think that was more based around like a lot of stuff happening in the national park, I believe. I have to, I would have to look into it a little bit more, but yeah, it just seemed like another way of just like, I don't know, again, like at least as a person of color, another form of that gatekeeping of just like, don't share resources <laughs> is kind of like how I interpreted it, you know? So, um, you know, so that's, that's kind of where my mindset went. Mm -hmm. It could have been, the, the intentions behind it could have been completely different, but that's kind of how I, and it seemed like um, Danielle might've taken that or other folks in the Jackson community that I've talked to or, have taken that as uh, folks of color themselves. I definitely perceived it as a as satirical, right? Like or like you know, some off brand like don't get a, like don't come here, like don't don't try and find this place, um, right? Because I'm telling you, I'm not going to tell you, <laughs> right? right. Um, a standoffish type um, facade, um, but at the same time, it kind of made me realize or not realize, but think about like what it, what the problem is. So I think the solution is education, but the problem lies within the system itself. Right. And I think like, uh, Anna and I were talking about this, uh, like yesterday, actually, I think, um, about how our natural resources, just our management systems, are literally run by secrecy. Without secrecy, our management systems would fall apart. None of it would work, right? Because everyone would be everywhere and uh, nothing would be functional um, rather than run by stewardship and knowledge and right, actually communal uh, collaboration to protect something um, and be in relationship with it. And so, like, yeah, that tag responsibly, you know, totally perpetuates that secrecy, right? Um, the problem, which also leads to the, or is connected, directly connected to the privatization of land, um, which is um, actually an, I was just talking to um, in a local knowledge holder um, from, uh, where I fish here in Iowa, and he's born and raised um, here and has known our waters for a very long time. And he's an ecologist. And so uh, he's also has a kind of a unique perspective on that. Uh, still white, but uh, a 
different perspective than most. Um, and he shared the how he believes, and I validate his experience, right? And understanding of the system because this is exactly how it's supposed to function. It brought so much clarity that I was like, I just didn't even expect it coming from that conversation. Mm -hmm. But he was like, you know, private water actually has protected our state, like our, our, our trout fisheries for a very long time because what it does this is his, him explaining this, but what it does is it allows people to fish in the public areas and the fish move and they take refuge during certain times of the year in those private areas. Um, and then they are allowed to basically repopulate, right? That those public areas for when people see that there's fish there. But what people think is that, um, oh, you know, they're just, the DNR just putting fish in, right? All the time. And they're always gonna be there. When that, it's a misunderstanding of the way that the fishery actually functions. Um, However, I'm not, I'm not saying that privatization is the answer. However, I do think that that is, it, that is the form of management that we have in place right now, um, that we are uh, leaning extreme so heavily on the exemption, the extraction of people, hmm. right? From, a, from, from the space, from the land that um that's our only answer mm -hmm. like are you uh, to me i'm like are you kidding me <laughs> like that so that's what you want to uphold for the rest of eternity right mm -hmm. is 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 ex extracting people from the land mm -hmm. um that sounds ridiculous to me i mean and and not to again discredit is ex you know the person i was talking to his experience and the way he's been taught the system right mm -hmm. however it is not working. <laughs> um, and it's not going to be working because we are seeing more and more and more people in interacting with the land, recreating with the land in, in different ways. And so unless we, ex or you get two options, right? You continue to push people away and say, no, you're the problem, or we greet them and, ex and actually you know, share and say, you know, we were like, the whole point is we're supposed to be here. <laughs> we're supposed to um, be on the land and, and interacting with it. And so if, you know, it all starts with, I think, and Basu had a, you know, I mean, he mentioned it in his post, like human rights, I mean, uh, access to land, access to the land is a human right. And I don't know, I, I haven't talked, I haven't come across anyone who would deny that. And so if that's true, and if that is the foundation of any argument for, or of any management system, natural resources management system, then we, privatization is not an option. It's not. Um, but, you know, I think that right now, uh, considering where we're at, I think it's also important to realize that that is the way our system functions um, and that it can be, um, sorry, it can be helpful to understand that in, I guess, thinking about ways to move forward. Um, I see, I saw the tag responsive, responsibly tag a while ago on Instagram when I was like kind of triggered. I was like, oh, like, here we go again with some marketing scheme. Tell me what to do or what not to do, you know? And then I was like, I'm going to tag all these places wherever I go and however I want. So my friends can see, yeah. but then I kind of like took a step back and I was like, okay, hold on, who started this and why is this in place, right? Because there is a reasoning behind whatever there is out there regarding social media and marketing. I'm like, this is another marketing tactic. Um, and then I think going back to what Marco mentioned was just like, this is tag responsibly kind of goes back to the resource management or kind of conservation side to things because I believe it came out when a bunch of influencers and I call them like negative influencers um, because there are influencers who are like change makers like all of us right who are like out there like raising hell pushing down boundaries and breaking down walls but then there's also those like trendy influencers from Southern California who are going to these places and um, you know taking cool pictures and not really being stewards of the land and not providing anything back to the community and just pretty much taking whatever they can and then leaving 
right? So like for me, like that tag responsibly is like, please like let's lessen the crowd that we see here, even though it's an incredibly beautiful place. And if someone slid into my DMs um, and asked like, hey, where can I go hiking? Like I saw you went to this beautiful bridge. Do you mind telling me? I'd be like, yeah, go ahead. Like here's this GPS coordinates. Here's how you should get there. Here's what you should bring. Here's what to pack. Um, I'm all about sharing these locations, but you know, like I, I don't want an influencer who has like hundreds and thousands of followers to promote trampling on wildflowers who are barely there throughout the years, you know, and like, or going to these famous fishing spots and trashing it. And you see that now and again, where these places that used to be so secluded and private, um, even though it's on public land are now being trampled by a bunch of people who are trashing it and finding ways to destroy and pretty much like deface a lot of these um, natural structures. And so for me, like that tag responsibly, even though it's a kind of a gatekeeping, it's more on like the conservation side for me of saying like, let's lessen down the amount of exposure this place is having. So it has a fighting chance of, you know, becoming more sustainable for future uses because I would love my kids and my kids' kids to see these places in its natural form, um, to have these like areas to enjoy and, and actually see it for what it is and not have to see it behind a gate, you know? And now you see that in Redwoods National Park and even Yosemite National Park, where now hundreds and thousands of people every single year want to climb up th that giant granite statue. And now they're closing it and having permits because our oils on our hand are kind of degrading that granite, you know? And now I'm seeing Redwoods from behind a fence structure. And it's like, this is not how I want to enjoy our natural areas, but also, I understand why it needs to be this way. When I first started seeing Tag Responsibly, it was mostly from white skier bros in Jackson skiing like very, I guess, unique lines within the park. So it was, it seemed like a slap to the face, you know, <laughs> as much as it was just like Tag Responsibly, but I won't tell you this super secret spot that I skied. <laughs> and it's like, it's kind of a, I don't know. It just seemed very condescending and like, um, again, just like glorifying their knowledge over the knowledge that we all might have or might not have about those resources. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for adding that. And actually that brings me to another point that I want to talk about is, um, is, is gatekeeping racist <laughs> and, Vasu, you were recently a meme on a fly fishing account, <laughs> and <laughs> good job because you're you're changing and shaking shit up. So I applaud you for that as well. So just curious on all anyone's thoughts to chime in on when you see that or when you hear that, um, you know. And a lot of that was in Danielle's article as well. That was the leading first um, bullet point is that um, geotagging is racist. So, um, what are some thoughts and reactions to that statement? I have a question for Vasu, if that's okay. Um, do you fly fish? Why are you on a fly fishing account in the first place? I have no idea. I got <laughs> pulled into it. No idea. My understanding slash experience with geotagging becoming racialized um, is through the fact that it's almost always white folks shaming folks of color for geotagging um, and other white folks but rare and i'm i talk i mean this publicly right like you know i've certainly offered a perspective you know to folks uh that i've seen either name or tag someplace and just just offer a different perspective and say hey you know um here's some information around this area you're welcome to do with it what you will um in a private message <laughs> um so yeah i think that like folks of color are way more likely to get publicly annihilated <laughs> for this um and yeah i just that i guess that's part of my my understanding i've seen it happen to other people i've had it happen to my you know myself as well in mm -hmm. multiple different contexts Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry that happened. And thanks for sharing that. I like how 
what Marco said of how geotagging started perpetuating into more of like a savior complex in a way of when back in the day when geotagging was like kind of a conservation movement of like let's save these places now it's more of like I'm going to gatekeep these places for my own enjoyment um, because of the Chads and Kevins of the world and the Karens. I know I'm going to get cancer for that, but it's okay. But <laughs> I'm like, we're seeing it more than ever, right? Because for me, it's about accessibility. And, you know, if I want people in suburban neighborhoods um, and kids and stuff go out to these places, I would like them to have the opportunity and the accessibility for finding these places. And I like how Marco said it's like <laughs> becoming more of a harsh rhetoric towards people of color. And that's so completely true because there is like accountability on both ends, but now it's like we're sharing it for other BIPOC folks to go and have these places and have a fighting chance to go see these places. And yet we're getting canceled for it. And we're getting, you know, DMs with like hate mail and hate messages of saying like, don't release my place and it's like it's not your land to begin with um so without that that dialogue or that discussion to be had it's kind of like that cancel culture or just like karen's and kevin's you know <laughs> throwing a fit at the grocery store floor of not wanting to share their places or their happy spots mm. yeah definitely see that. i think you bring up a really good um point anna um, I was just thinking while I was reading the article and just looking at Basu's um, post and just kind of thinking about um, all of the meetings I've been in today regarding land, right, and the future of it. And I came to the conclusion that I feel like there's various levels of geotagging, right? There's like the white colonizer geotagging, there's the native indigenous geotagging, there's the people of color geotagging, and you know, I think it, there's a lot of shaming involved throughout our communities. And one thing that's kind of hard for me is to kind of sit and watch the shaming happen um, within, our, within our communities because, you know, we all have different stories, right? We all have different relationships to the land and the water. Um, we all have a different ancestral past um, and we don't know these stories, right? We don't know um, the, the background behind these things. And so for, you know, me as a native woman who is grounded in the land and who educates and encourages people to get on the land and to, you know, we have a saying like this, this is the land our ancestors walked on. Mm -hmm. um, and so for, I feel like for me, and I, you know, I want to kind of go on a limb out there for our native indigenous communities, geotagging is, you know, a different version for sure than our, the white colonizers. Um, that yes, sometimes we use it to gather medicine, right? Um, sometimes we use it to gather strength because this land is strong in its presence or whatnot. And sometimes we don't um, geotag at all because we want to keep these sacred places safe and we want to keep the sacredness within that land, within that like certain spot. Um, and I'm sure it rains, it, it, it's different for, you know, our Black community, our Asian community, our Latino commun community, you know, we all have different ties to the land and the waters. And so geotagging means many, many great things, but unfortunately, we are still stuck in the white colonization world. We are still stuck within that language, right? And there's, you know, I, you know, Marco talks a lot about the relationships and, you know, Anna with education. Where is that right now? We, I mean, we're still working towards that because we are still stuck in white colonization in how to use our, the, our vernacular, right? Um, and I love, you know, you thinking about it with Pinar, um, who's a non-binary um, person, they have so much deepness and connection to the land, right? So their idea of the land and geotagging or, you know, other uh, subjects is going to be completely different than mine or, you know, with Basu's or, you know, whatnot. So 
I think trying to like give space to the ebb and flow, give space to that language, give space for that relationship. So my interpretation is that racism is a spectrum, just like everything else in our lives. Um, you can be anti-racist and racist uh, within the same day. I personally think like, you know, if we just arbitrary example, if we're, you know, driving a car that uses oil, like it disproportionately impacts people of color. So it's racist. It's like, but then like, we can also be anti-racist by going to shop at a black owned business. So it's like, I personally think as uh, Jalen put it is it really depends on when and where and how we're utilizing that mode of communication, whether it be geotagging or whatever, like, if, you know, if we're geotagging something on an ancestral land that's sacred to indigenous people, that might be racist to geotag. Whereas like if we're geotagging a more prominent spot in a national park, like, yeah, like more people of color, more resources are available there. There's, you know, a lot more uh, money that is going into those parks to be able to try to like protect some of that stuff. So it's like, it's, I, I personally think it's not this binary of like geotagging is racist or not racist or whatever. It's like, it really depends on the situation and um, just like understanding when and how to utilize that, mm -hmm. whether it be privately or publicly. You know, this goes both ways. There's those that geotag and then there's the recipients, right? There's the followers to those accounts, those that are reading the geotags, those that are clicking on the geotags. Um, and there's also, I think, you know, needs to not like, uh, in order to allow this spectrum to exist of geotagging and of intention um, healthfully, <laughs> Uh, there also needs to be healthy recipients of that, right? And interpret and interpreters of that. Um, and typic and typically that comes through a relationship uh, with the person who is geotagging, right? So I think it is also important that we are cognizant of our positionality within the relationship of a post, right? Uh, do I know that person well enough, or that right that account? well enough to interpret um, the right way, you know, interpret that geotag um, in the way that they're meaning it to come across. Um, for example, you know, those that know me personally would know that I don't geotag very often, but if I did, it probably, I probably did it with a very, uh, very intentionally. Um, and so, you know, uh, people might contact me and say, hey, you know, uh, you mentioned this place, you know, what does it mean to you? Or I might just put it in the post itself. You might just want to read the post, right? And I think that's, all, that's also part of this too is, you know, the tag responsively geotag reminds me a lot of the black square, hmm. um, right? What does it mean? What does it mean? What are you doing about it, right? What are you saying about it? Like, where's the action? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's a lot of folks that will geotag or just, uh, and I'm not saying that you have to do this, but this is a thought, a food for thought, right? Is even, uh, it's a, a form of a positionality statement, um, right? And I'm, 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 this again, I'm not saying that folks have to do this, but uh, just an idea, um, you know, and integrating what that place means to you um, why it's there, why the geotag is there, um, kind of giving it some context. Mm -hmm. um, and then those that maybe want to visit that place, um, maybe should ask, right? Should ask you about it. Um, kind of like I would ask uh, another angler about their area or another guide or something like that. Mm -hmm. And asking the land too. Um, I think I learned about that recently or kind of reminded about it recently by reading the book Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer and how she was talking about like not only when you're harvesting something or visiting a place or taking a natural resource um, you want to ask the natural resource in return so having that reciprocity is also as important so even though it's like owned by one person on private land or 
it's this person's fishing water. It's, it doesn't really belong to ever anyone, but the earth and earth itself. And so kind of having that acknowledgement is super important. Um, and I started practicing it now when I go out and say like, okay, I'm in this place. Let me acknowledge the land that I'm on. And also like being aware if I am standing in a place or want to pick a flower to remember it's asking like hey is this okay can I bring this back somehow and having that reciprocity is super important mm. yeah and that's so beautiful thank you for sharing that and I think to piggyback on that is to when you ask you know to be a recipient and to just kind of you know stand there and you know hear if you're if you're welcomed or you're not. I mean, there's been places where I walk in and or I walk to the trail and I usually say a little prayer. Um, and then I start walking and I'm like, nope, this is nope. And you just like turn around and you go back to your car or you go somewhere else, right? There's actually been a couple of places on the water where I've had that experience too. And, you know, sometimes it makes me wonder what that particular land or water went through you know, why is it not quite inviting? Um, but yeah, I think that's really beautiful, Anna. Thank you for sharing. Any other things that you want to share um, about geotagging or anything else that you want to bring up? Um, yeah. General. No, I mean, other than like, just like, it's more so just being open to sharing resources on how we can protect our land in a reciprocal manner is more what I'm trying to get at as much as possible. And I feel like there is a way that we can still all be able to connect with our land, but also at the same time, succinctly provide education to be able to steward it. So, mm -hmm. you know, being able to recreate on the land is great and it's a wonderful way to, you know, feel regulated emotionally, mentally, physically, but also understand that there is a reciprocity there of, you know, again, relational, not just with humans, but other than humans as well, where we have to give back in a way that's uh, sustainable and reciprocal. So that's kind of, that's kind of where I'm, where my mindset is. Awesome. I love that. Thank you so much. And I, I just want to clarify, because I, I know I talked to several folks that had an array of different responses to Vasu's post um, and I think that one of them is that, you know, in the post, it mentions that the geotagging argument is racist. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of folks, particularly white men, read it as uh, geotagging is racist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and based off of our conversation, um, I'm going to assume that we can agree that it, it in and of itself is not, uh, but the way it is used can be. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, you know, I think a, some people I know had a confused experience reading that in that, you know, if you don't geotag, then you're also racist, right? Because you're not giving information. That's at least in my understanding. That's also not true. <laughs> yeah. um, like sharing information, uh, you know, of course, is always um, welcomed and and um, you know an awesome thing to do. But uh, just because you don't geotag doesn't mean it is inherently, you know, you're inherently racist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up because, yeah, it's so easy to hear like, people get triggered by being called a, like, that's just kind of seems like currently being thrown around, like everyone's a racist, right? Or, and, and you know, there's some, there's some nuances to that because there's so many layers when we think about systemic racism and how information is shared. And so it's kind of just kind of it's it's within context and kind of the why you know you're you're behaving the way that you are whether you are geotagging or not um it's really more complex than just saying that geotagging is racist so yeah absolutely i agree with that cool yeah anna um and then just kind of like to echo what everyone else was saying the entire past hour or so in this conversation um i believe that like shame and kind of embarrassment 
and or antagonizing people when it comes to geotag or regardless of anything or not regardless of anything but some issues that won't make a difference um we should start with it by having open dialogue and discussions and educating people so like if we are victims of geotagging or if it's harmful to a place or we see it happening or we are personally doing it ourselves, um, I just want to kind of challenge people to kind of sit down and reflect like what geotagging means to you and how your biases are playing a role in it. Um, just because as you can tell, like all of our conversations today, like we didn't have one overall concept of geotagging. We all like came from this place and Jalen brought into her perspective and Marco and Vasu and Erica. Um, so please just start having open dialogues and discussions with everyone and um, lessen that cancel culture or like calling people racist um, until necessary. And, you know, just start learning and having these conversations on geotagging and just other difficult subjects. So mm -hmm. yeah, kind of highlighting that a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, really well said, you know, I definitely have posted that it is racist. Only the reason being is I, I kind of have this lens of uh, why are white folks hoarding land or areas that doesn't belong to them? <laughs> and so that's kind of more or less how I've, I've, I've seen that and use that into context with um, how I tie that into racism, at least, is because it's so multi-layered and systemic. So, um, but it's really hard to, for, for someone to hear that and to automatically understand that, right? Because there's some complexities and layers to that. So um, I really appreciate you calling that out and, and saying that. So thanks. Um, any other final thoughts or, or things you want to add to the conversation? Cool. So how can people find you other than geo, your geotag? <laughs> so, <laughs> and anything that you would like to promote? And we'll go ahead and start with um, Anna. So you can find me at um, Anna underscore venturing. I have a website coming soon that I will release on my social media accounts. Um, but I'm a biologist and an educator. So if you're ever wanting to learn something new about how to navigate the outdoors or fishing, um, I started only five years ago. So I'm a beginner myself. But with that, I have a lot of new resources and ways to teach you all to be comfortable and confident out there. So feel free to reach out to me. Um, and I highly encourage you to all be stewards of your land, starting within your community. Look out for nonprofit organizations and also just community members to work with and be activists. I mean, I mostly do my advocacy work through Instagram and uh, through like private consultation work. So uh, Instagram is just my name, Vasu Sojitra. Um, and then, um, you know, just trying to push out uh, some of the initiatives that I'm a part of, uh, Jalen is a part of a few of them as well. So, um, of course, the new one that we just created and are pushing out is the Outdoor Futures Act, trying to um, gain and create more funding to distribute to uh, marginalized communities, historically excluded communities. Um, and then also uh, the project that I I'm currently trying to expand on is the Inclusive Outdoors Project to more so connect, um, again, those same similar communities. Uh, the three populations we're working within is um, uh, folks of color, uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, uh, disabled or adaptive, um, and then uh, the queer, LGBTQ, trans uh, community as well to connect them with mountain sports like ice climbing, backcountry skiing, mountaineering and alpinism and rock climbing so all of those awesome mouthful but yes yeah. Jaylen. <laughs> you can find me at Jaylen j-a-y-l-y-n dot goff g-o-u-g-h or at native women's wilderness and i too would really like to push out the initiative for the outdoor future act um i am really really excited about it i'm excited about it for our children, our native, um, native communities. And I'm excited about like what we're expanding the conversation, you know, how we're expanding the conversation, how we're um, really, I think we're gonna kind of ruffle up some Congress feathers there. Um, and I, I like how our website um, just brings it all to, you know, within 
like one sentence. It just like brings it all to you. So I'm going to read it because I'm, I'm really proud of it. Yeah. Standing on stolen land and re recreating on broken treaties, the Outdoor Future Initiative seeks to build momentum for the creation of a national equity fund that will ensure long-term investments in programs to serve all youth with opportunities to explore the great outdoors. And, you know, I think, you know, having that discussion about um, recreating on stolen lands and having the discussion that, you know, the outdoor industry is gleaning billions of dollars on stolen land um, is a really important conversation that we need to discuss. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud that this initiative is prepared to have these hard conversations with Congress and leaders of our country and to bring resources to um, our rural communities and communities who are lacking resources. So yeah. I'm, I'm really proud to be a part of this initiative and I'm really excited to see where it goes. Yay, awesome. Well, thank you for doing that work and for sharing that. That is very exciting and let us know how um, I can support that as well. But I'm sure there's gonna be more information coming down. Yes, and I can, if you wanna help share throughout your social media, um, I can give you guys the links and um, I can share the stories and stuff with you guys too. Sweet, that'd be great. Awesome, thank you. Um, and Marco. That sounds awesome. I would love to support you and, and the organization in any way I can. Um, yeah, so, and on that note, like you can find me um, at uh, on Instagram or on Facebook um, at ChicanXFly. Uh, X I C A N X space fly F L Y, um, and yeah, um, it's kind of what I'm doing. I'm I'm a professional tire. I'm a guide. You know, I'll be in Iowa until the end of May. Uh, my last guide trip will be May 9th. Um, I'll be graduating. Um, mm -hmm. Cross my fingers. At least I'll be graduating. <laughs> um, and um, can't speak too soon. Um, a lot of work to still be done, <laughs> uh, especially in a pandemic. <laughs> but um, yeah, and uh, I'll be moving somewhere fun, uh, hopefully, <laughs> and somewhere new and um, to start a new journey, a new relationship um, with people and, and a new land, um, hopefully in a really healthy way. So Awesome. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, real quick, Anna, last time you were on my podcast, you were looking for a job. Did you find a job? Yes. It's been actually a 70 hour week. I'm exhausted. I <laughs> cried only three times today. That's, <laughs> um, <laughs> feel free to cut that out too, or keep it in. I don't really care anymore, but yeah, I got a new job with the Portland, Oregon school district, um, doing environmental education. So mm -hmm. I'll be working remotely with, um, my folks in Southern California and staying here, but it will be reaching out throughout the Portland, Oregon, Oregon, um, school districts. And because outdoor school can't happen in person, we're bringing it online. So I'm super excited to do, um, teaching and showing them really awesome activities such as like owl palette dissections and salmon ecology and get them really stoked so yeah thank you for asking Erica <laughs> yeah now our listeners can sleep sound, sound I know <laughs> <laughs> don't have a boyfriend yet that's still open everyone no I'm kidding <laughs> same here same here <laughs> I'm starting to get ideas for a season two, by the way. This, this is good stuff. <laughs> Got it. All right. I'm going to stop recording right now. Anna had a great ending statement. Reflect on what geotagging means to you and how your biases play into it. Have the conversation. Start thinking beyond the binary of good or bad and make more informed decisions that don't result in bullying or elitism. Thank you again to Jalen, Marco, Vasu, and Anna for your time and sharing your perspective. While we're not all avid anglers on this panel, we all share the love of the outdoors and I encourage all folks, no matter your preferred activity, to talk to others that recreate outdoors too. We are all better when we can talk about issues and ultimately come together for the protection of our sacred places. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Head over to awkwardangler.com for show notes and resources. You can send appreciations by subscribing, sharing with a friend, rating the podcast, or Venmo at Awkward Angler. 
Special thanks to my brown folks fishing family for your support. I'm Erica Nelson, inviting you to be an awkward angler. See you next week.